Hey, Kate, how are you doing today? I'm good, Drew. How are you? Boy, back from vacation. I know, I know. I loved it. I think I might even be in the same clothes as I was last time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was great. It was nice to truly relax, unplug, and disconnect from the world and kind of just have trust and faith in my other empower advisors to to kind of carry me if there were things that were needed when I was gone. It was very nice. Love it, dude. So how are always, you doing, man? Always I good to have a reset. That's it, man. That's it. How are you doing? I saw you cranking out deals uh, recently. Dude, I have been tremendously busy. I love that. Uh, but but it's been a blessing. So um, yeah, kind of kind of be more more thankful and um, excited to get get another week started. Let's get some more deals on their contract, baby. Let's go. Let's go. So Thursday, our next NGRN, not this Thursday, but next, August 31st, myself and Guy Welsh from Empower will be speaking. Sure. Very excited. Uh, it is at the Sands as usual, 5.30 to 8.30 typical time, but looking forward to it. It's it's exciting to kind of shift back into the whole business mindset. We've kind of surpassed that summer fling, sort of like everyone's out of town and kind of all over the place. And now it's time to reset, get back in the mode. So I'm excited, looking forward to it. Let's get it, dude. Yeah, I'm stoked. Why don't you start us off? Absolutely, absolutely. So for me, um, going over just the market updates, we've had a rough couple of weeks. S&P last week was down 1.75% or down about, or up, you know, up about 15% for the year. Russell 2000 down about 2.93%, but still up 6.1% on the year. And then the Dow Jones down about 2.04%, still up about 4.12%. Uh, I do see, again, this is not financial advice. This is just my opinion and where I think things are going. I do see the market moving in a direction towards the downside for the remainder of the year. Uh, we did have a really nice upside, and I don't think we're going to lose gains. I definitely don't think we're going to end the year negative. However, I do foresee us giving up a little bit of the gains. So like on the S&P being up 15.12%, we could give up pretty easily an additional 5 to 7%, still be positive that 8% return that we all strive for. And I see that totally being a possibility, but I, I do see us sort of falling into a little bit of a downside with just uncertainty and things moving in the economy and the government as they are. Uh, you know, you have all this crises going on. You got Hurricane Hillary that I was chasing away on my boat this week um, that's making landfall. And, and then you also have everything that's going on in Hawaii and you've got everything going on in Ukraine. That war is still happening. So I just think with all this natural disaster and and, you know, all of these geopolitical events going on it just sparks uncertainty which the market doesn't like and that tends to lead on the downside so my you know call to action at least on the investment side is just again continue to invest don't try to time the market you know definitely don't sell anything continue your investment plan as you know as you should but just keep in mind that you might be in for a little bit of a rocky road from here on out for the rest of the year so that's it for me man how about you yeah, so I'm going to go over the Tucson market um, as far as July 2023. Um, the average sales price in Tucson was $330,000, up $1,000 from June. Um, so the look of this graph since December 2022, we've kind of been stagnant um, in the Tucson market. So it's really just been hovering around that $328,000 to $330,000 range month over month. Um, days on market. Um, we saw an increase um, of one day from 14 to 15 in July 2023. Uh, that's only two weeks. So that's relatively still very quick um, when you look at, you know, a 10 year period. Um, if I was to go over uh, a 10 year period, you know, we're still in the lowest points over, you know, a decade worth of time. Um, you know, the next, the next, uh, part in the decade that we were at, you know, a two week period was May of 2020. And that was really the beginning of, you know, super hot markets when kind of COVID hit. So you see that dip, um, the lowest point was September, 2021, which was five days. Um, and that was consistent for like half a year. Um, so 
Again, you know, on average, I would say looking at this graph over the past 10 years, the average has probably been more around 40 days. And again, right now we're sitting at 15. So we're still well below the, the average days on market for the past 10 years. Month supply, uh, we're at 1.9. Um, so again, that just shows us as consumers, the volatility of the market, um, or excuse me, the velocity of the market. So how quick it's kind of moving. So if no other homes came on the market today, how long would it take to sell all the current inventory? Um, so once so almost two months is what it's taking. That tells me we're really still in a strong seller's market. Again, that's also the lowest point, one of the lowest points in the past 10 years. So, you know, I think I'm just going to stop there with the data. My biggest call to action, and I was discussing this with Drew before we started recording, is I want people to understand whether you're a realtor, whether you're an investor, whether you're a buyer or seller, um, a consumer, pay attention to these numbers. People are very nervous about, you know, the market crashing. I have buyers every day asking me, well, should I just wait two years and see what happens? No, you should not wait. And I'm telling you that as an investor, not as a realtor to try to sell you, okay? If I waited another two years, okay, you are going to be subject to whatever the future has in store and no one can predict that. What I know right now is that the month supply, the days on market, the sales price has all continued to, well, the sales price has continued to go up. Days on market has been going down over the past decade. That tells me there's nothing out there. There is nothing out there if you're a buyer or an investor. So my biggest call to action for you guys is the real estate market is still looking strong. I can't tell you how many properties I call on and they already have multiple offers. There has not been one property I've sold probably this year, I would even argue to say, that the buyer has only made one offer and it got accepted and we went through. There has been multiple offers on every home I've sold this year and it does not look like it's going to slow down, even with where rates are at, where, where they're at right now. Um, so rates can go one of two ways. It can go up or it can go down. Being that right now where rates are at a 7% and there's still this much competition to buy, does that mean that if it jumps one to 2%, it's just going to completely crash and no one's going to be buying anymore? I don't know. I can't believe that. I just don't believe that that would happen. But what happens if it goes the other way? What if it goes 2% percentage points down to a five? Well, it's going to be a frenzy again, right? We're going to see another 2021. So um, biggest call to action, pay attention to the market. It still looks strong. If you are needing to buy, sell, invest, whatever you need to do, work with a professional and pull the trigger. Don't make decisions based on data that hasn't even happened yet. That's stupid. You know, that's as simple as I can say it. Don't make decisions based on data that hasn't happened yet. Make decisions based on data that is current right now and listen to a professional. So anyway, that's my call to action. Drew, what's our topic of the day? Well, real quick, before we dive into that, I do want to hit on something too, because I completely agree. And like, I have my investment call to action, but I was having a conversation with someone over the weekend and they fit the bill, the fit the mold of the exact objections that these realtors come into all the time. And I, you know, thankfully to these calls that you and I have, I was able to kind of communicate to my friend, like, Hey, that's not the smartest decision. Anyways, Cliff Notes version of my friend and who I was speaking to was stationed in Italy in the military for a while, got moved. And now he's going to be stationed in South Carolina. He was in, he's in town for a month, kind of during his hiatus transition point, kind of seeing family, seeing friends, all that. And we were having the conversation. I said, Hey, are you going to buy in South Carolina? You know, you didn't buy in Italy. And I, you know, I, it was like a bummer, but are you going to take advantage of the fact that you can buy, use your VA and buy in, in South Carolina? And he's like, no, I don't think so. And I said, why? And he's like, well, we were dead set on it until I had a conversation with my wife's dad. And he was like, oh, it's really bad, blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't buy, you know, interest rates are really high. Home prices are super high. Like, it's just not a good time. And I said to him, I said, if you buy a property, I said, let me just, let me just backtrack here. If you buy a property, are you going to hold it for a month, a year, two years, or just going to be a long-term holding period? 
And he's like, well, yeah, I'm probably going to be stationed there for four or five years. And then on top of that, you know, I'd eventually like to hold on to it as a rental. I was like, great. So the numbers that you need to look at have nothing to do with what the home value is short term. They have to do with, can you rent it for more than what the actual mortgage will cost you? That's the only thing you need to look at. Similar to a multifamily syndication, if the deal pencils, it pencils, it makes sense. He was like, oh, I never thought about it that way. And I'm like, you have access to the military to almost guarantee that there will be renters in there 24 seven, because just like you, people are getting stationed and moved around all the time. You can make it a renter j- rental just for the military, like yourself, when you leave. Long story short is, I think I convinced them really well that it doesn't matter what happens short term, think long term on these plans. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I think I convinced and changed his argument, but again, I see it just now with my own friends. And so it definitely is out there. Bye, bye, bye. Don't wait till the end. You know, don't, don't you know, what's funny. Time. You know, what's funny about that. It makes me want to ask the dad, Hey dad, did you ever buy a home 30 freaking years ago? Chances are you probably did. You owned it for 30 years. Now it's completely paid off. And now you're multiple six figures richer. Yeah. Holy crap. Look at the power of real estate, dude. And now you want to encourage your son not to do that? Uh-huh. It's just uh-huh. idiotic to me. It's, yeah. it's idiotic. <laughs> exactly. And uh-huh. guess what? Guess what? Guess what happened in that time frame of that 30-year ownership? The 2008, 2009 housing crisis, where housing prices, housing prices went down substantially, yet he's still above that today. So yeah, I get it. it it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. So. It's tough too, you know, because like I talked to people who went through 2008 and it was a hard time, right? It, it was a hard time. I can't even fathom what was going on, right? We have the privilege of coming into the businesses we have at a time where it's pretty good. I mean, let's not, let's not lie about it. It's pretty freaking good, right? It's not necessarily easy to make money, but opportunities there if you want to work hard, right? Yeah. And so, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to, you know, be ignorant to the fact that when you talk to a lot of these people that lost homes, I literally was just having a conversation with a guy out of Phoenix who lost all, he had like 30 flips going on at one time in 2008 when the price is, so he's leveraged to a hill. I mean, he is, he is seriously over leveraged, right? And this is the importance of what you and I discuss. Please talk with a professional someone who's doing what you want to do, someone who has owned real estate for a long time, regardless of where the market was. Those are the people you want to talk to. And what I can tell you, what they're going to say, because I talk to them, they're going to tell you buy long-term debt, cash flowing assets, and pay them off. Don't over leverage yourself. Have a game plan to pay them off over the long term, because then another 2008 happens and you're leveraged to a hilt and you're screwed. Right. So take take 2008 for what it is. Learn from it. The fact that they were overbuilding and there was predatory lending, lending out money people couldn't pay back. Right. Take that and say, okay, how can I do it differently moving forward here? Well, I can buy assets that cash flow. Right. Not stuff where I'm paying 500 bucks a month to hold it. And then I could fix my debt products for long periods of time. Right. So anyway, it's just, it blows my mind that, you know, like his dad can, can, you know, recommend that. And chances are he probably, he probably himself owns a house that he bought 30 years ago, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just crazy. Absolutely. But side tangent, now jumping back into, to uh, what it is, our call to action, our biggest call to action and what we really want to hit on for the, the week is just the importance of follow-up. Uh, before we kind of, before we started recording, Kate and I were discussing, you know, just some scenarios that have just closed or happened recently that just goes to show the importance of follow-up. So my story was I had a client that I have been consistently following up with since January, consistently calling, reaching out to, staying in front of, and you know, time and time again, he'd say, oh, I'm not ready, or he wouldn't answer, or he'd have something going on that was out of his control that he was preoccupied with. And he's trying to run a business, super busy, but I never gave up and I continue to follow up. 
And, you know, eventually it got to the point where I was calling him less and less frequently, not every week, but still reaching out. And finally, he called me and said, hey, I'm ready. But I think had I just given up at attempt one or attempt two, I would have never saw this lead come to fruition. And so just that importance of following up. But I know Cade's got some stats and you also have got some of your own story. So I would love to just pass that off to you and, and share what you've learned and, and your experience. Yeah, I mean, first off, congrats, Drew, because that's sick. And most people will give up. What I can say um, is, and, and I can, I feel like I can speak for both Drew and I when I say this, is that when we came into this business, we're still very young in this business. We don't, we definitely do not know it all by any means, um, but we try to learn as much as possible. And what we've done early on in our business is we try to learn from people who were in a better position than we were. And those people are some of the top dogs, right? And so we want to learn from them because they have over the years built an incredible business um, that we want to try to replicate over time. And one of the things that's very important they taught us is the importance of follow-up and the structure of the follow-up. So you have to have a system when you're calling leads or calling people who are interested in your business. And I believe that realtors, financial advisors, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, lawyers, whatever, different people who are, who are uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word, 1022, what the heck is the income? 1099. 1099, thanks. So people who are 1099, right? They have to hustle because they, I mean, they only make money when they sell something, right? And so for us, it, it's very, um, it is very important that you have a system with your follow-up. So I just want to hit on a couple points that Drew and I have both learned um, and something we implement in our business. So first and foremost, um, we call, at least I do, we call seven times in a row. And if the prospect does not pick up or does not, you know, cooperate, whatever you want to call it, then we scrap that lead. We do not call them back because we don't want to waste our times, you know, spending time with someone who doesn't want our service. So what I do is the, the day I get a lead, I try to call them as soon as I can. And then if they don't answer for seven days, so for a straight week, I call them every day. If they don't answer at the end of those seven days, I scrap them. Um, the important, the other important piece is that we try to reach out to them within five minutes of the lead. So as soon as a lead comes in or whatever, we're trying to service them as quick as possible. Um, and then the two other, you know, major points are the time of day that you call someone and the days that you call them. Wednesdays and Thursdays typically tend to be the best between four and five p.m because that's kind of the middle of the week. People have gotten over the beginning of the week and all their work, and now they're kind of settling into their routine towards the middle of the week. And then four to five is typically when people are getting off work. So those are kind of the four points. Um, we call seven times. Um, we call you know Wednesdays, Thursdays, between four and 5 p.m. And when we do get a lead, we try to respond within the first five minutes. All of those items help us connect with someone uh, it gives us the best chance to connect with someone versus any other tactic. And that was uh, done um, by Harvard, a study where they cold called 100,000 people over the course of, I think, five years or three years. So we use that. I mean, I use that in my business. And then let's say I do connect with someone, then I'll put them in either a weekly, monthly, or every two month contact list that I reach out to them. You know, so every single person that comes across either my social media, a uh, word of mouth referral, a uh, website, Zillow lead, whatever it is, you know, that they are getting put in that system and they're getting followed up with, um, that can, in, you can ensure at that point that none of those people should, if, if they decide not to do business with you, they at least know your name, right? Because you're reaching out to them constantly and they know who you are. And so very important to prospect. It, it's, you know, I, when you look at a business model, the first two steps, you have lead generation, right? So generating leads for your business. And then the second step would be lead conversion. And that follow-up process, the four steps I just gave, really are the key to that lead conversion part. Absolutely. I know that was a lot, but I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it is really figuring out, 
you know, what works best for you and in your business. But, you know, those metrics, those numbers are proven. Like it doesn't matter, you know, what it is and how you kind of navigate your calls and all of that, but calling seven times and calling seven times, whether that's seven times in the same week or that's seven times once a week for seven weeks, like depend, just having a system where you are calling consistently and touching and trying to touch base. And when you touch base with them, your next, you should never end the phone call without a plan of action as to how you can talk to them again. You know, cause sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm not ready right now. It's not a good time. Well, then I always say, you know, call me back. When, when would be a good time that I can follow up with you again, that you think would be a good time that you are more ready? Or yeah. how about I check with the, check in with you next week? And if they say yes to any of that, then you say, okay. And you mark it in your calendar and you say, follow up with this person or however you do your, your sale, you know, your CRMs or however you mm -hmm. run your business and your tracking, you're marking that within that to say, Hey, I need to call this person this day or this person this day. And you stay true to that. Yeah. So. I think it's important to, I was talking with, uh, Luke Ladon. Mm, my man and, uh, super cool dude right and so we're just talking about business and, and all this stuff and we ultimately came down to the fact of like dude just do what you say you're gonna do and you'll beat out 90 percent of other professionals yep. i mean it's astonishing bro how many I, and i'm in it because i see real estate agents all the time so i see it specifically with realtors but drew i imagine you can you know you have the same thing it's holy crap how do you do business i don't understand because you suck at your job and i don't say that to be rude but people don't even get back to people they don't even say or they don't even do what they say they're going to do it's like how do you do business bro so anyway you know just do what you're saying you're going to do if you're on the phone with someone and they say hey please call me back at four o'clock put it in your freaking calendar call them back at four o'clock yep yeah and it's crazy this is one last stock shocking statistic that I heard. It's like somewhere around 60%. I don't remember the exact amount, but somewhere around 60% of referrals don't even receive a second phone call. Isn't that insane? That's like crazy. they get a referral, they call them the first time, they don't hear from them, they never call them back. A hot lead. I would kill to have a hot lead, like kill and call more than once. So yeah. blows my mind. But I think the ending point is just Kate and I wanted to run through instead of our quote for the day, our verbiage that we use for what we like to call our breakup text. What a breakup text is, is, you know, you've hit those seven days, you've had those calls, they aren't getting back to you. How do you say, okay, I'm no longer going to be calling you anymore. I, it's, I don't want to waste my own time. And so we call that the breakup text. And so Cade and I, I'm sure use different verbiage for our breakup text, but this is how mine goes. So I give a call, ring, ring, don't answer. I leave a voicemail. My voicemail goes, hello, there's Mr. Client. I hope you're doing well. It seems to me that your interest in our process has cooled. And so I will no longer be reaching out to you. There's a fine line between being a pest and being a professional. And so I do not want to cross that line of being a pest. So I will no longer be contacting you if for whatever reason you need my assistance or your interest returns, I would love to be a resource to you and you know how to reach me. My phone number again is 520 blank, 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 blank. Thank you so much. Have a great day. That's what my verbiage looks like and sounds like. So Dang, that's beautiful. You like that? Thank you. I do. <laughs> Kid, I actually used it today, so that's why it's fresh on my mind. But <laughs> okay, what is yours? What is your verbiage? Yeah, so same situation. Call seven times, they don't answer. Um, so then I leave a breakup uh, voicemail um, and a text, and they both sound the same. And it's basically, "Hey, Drew, this is Cade." And the reason I don't explain further is because at that point they already know who I am because I've already been trying to reach them. Right, so I say. Hey, Drew, this is Cade. Um, I've been, I've left you several messages and haven't heard back yet. So if interest is cool, I completely understand and it won't hurt my feelings. Let me know either way. So I know how to proceed. Thanks. Mm, I love That's that. It. So I it's just kind of short, kind of to the point. And I actually, um, Dalton gave me that one. Um, but it's just nice because it's like, 
they almost feel bad when I, when I leave that, they always will text me back like, Oh, I'm so sorry. My, you know, my aunt was sick and I had to go see her and I've been traveling, blah, 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 blah. So it always gets a response. So yeah, that's, that's what, that's what I do. I love that. I love that. And yours is short, sweet to the point. Mine might be a little bit too long. Um, but yeah, it, it's great. I absolutely love it. And I think it really works because you're right. I've seen it time and time again, where they give it a response and if they yeah. do give a response and it's like, yeah, I've never had someone lie to me and say, I'm actually still interested. And then it, you know, it, it didn't work out. They either have an excuse and it ends up working out. Like it just takes a little bit more or they don't respond to me at all. And I just take hint that they're done or, you know, they, they just say, yeah, interest is cool that I, I am not interested. Thank you yeah. so much. So it's a yeah. great way to proceed and you're not losing sleep over if they're going to convert, if they're going to do business, you just, sometimes it's good to know. I hate being in that awkward position where I don't know. I'd rather either know you're not going to be a lead so I can go find new ones or yeah. I can, you know, or to continue to work with you. So, right. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, dude. Yeah. Sweet. Well, thank, you. thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And reminder, August 31st, Thursday, it is our uh, NGRN event at the Sands Club, 538.30. So I hope to see you all there. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Drew. Can't wait for it. Yes, sir. All right. Take care.